This conference will now be recorded. According to his promise, we are looking for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you look for these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, spotless and blameless, and grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our growth comes through the scriptures. Join me, if you would, in the word of God in Acts chapter 2. We're going to get started tonight in Acts 2. I'll put it up on the screen for us. We're getting better at this. Had some more practice this morning. Learning some new uh, techniques. Some new uh, Acts 2.42 uh, is the verse I'm headed for. <clears throat> I learned a better way this morning to um, kind of coordinate the PowerPoint slideshow with the uh, with the log off screens. And so I'm going to try to doing that again a few more times until I get real comfortable with it. And I appreciate any feedback that uh, that comes from uh, folks that are taking part. All right, so uh, on Sunday we began a series on uh, local church dynamics and uh, we're gonna wrap it up tonight and I don't even expect it's gonna take the whole hour tonight. So we can uh, we can wrap this up and tie the things together and then we can go to an extended uh, Q&A time because we do like to do questions and answers on Wednesdays and I wanna resume that tradition tonight. So we'll do. Uh, I'll start with the prepared material, and then we'll uh, we'll go to the to the Q and A time after that. I also have a couple of uh, Bible study demonstrations I thought would be useful to do, and so depending on how much time we have uh, left over, we uh, we will do that tonight as well. So starting Sunday morning, then when we come back on Sunday, that's when I anticipate that we will uh, resume our our normal. Uh, our normal uh, Colossians material and our normal Hebrews material, and we'll just uh, take everything moving forward at that point. So local church dynamics, and this is what we were looking at on Sunday. We, uh, I'll get my slideshow going here. Just a simple uh, outline like we used to do back in the day when we put a topical study together. It's been a while since we've done a topical study like this. Uh, Roman number one will be introduction and definitions, where we try to set the table for the material that we're studying. Uh, the uh, vocabulary, of course, for local church is ecclesia. So the same Greek word for church, whether it's local church or church universal, is the same vocabulary. So you don't know by vocabulary whether uh, you're talking about local church or church universal. You only determine that by context. Uh, but this is what a local church is. It is the ecclesia at a particular locality. As soon as it's localized, as soon as it belongs somewhere, like the church at Ephesus, the church at Corinth, the church at uh, Laodicea, as soon as it's the church at, you know that you're referring to, uh, that the New Testament is referring to a local church. It is a golden lampstand. That's what Revelation 1, 2, and 3 describes it as. It's a golden lampstand. That is, as its spirit indwelled, it is, uh, it is shining forth the light of the word of God. And uh, it's identified with the community where it is planted. It comprises all the regenerate souls that are allotted to the charge of a shepherd, accountable to the chief shepherd. And that's important too. There are seven lampstands and seven stars, one per lampstand. And Jesus Christ walks in the midst of every lampstand and he holds the stars in his right hand. So that's, uh, again, definition for what a church is. I think there's a lot of uh, churches out there that are not biblical churches, not per New Testament definitions. There's a lot of parachurch ministries. There's a lot of other uh, church-like things that are really informal Bible studies or home fellowships, things like that. But they are not golden lampstands planted by Jesus Christ with a right-hand messenger held in his right hand. And I think it's important that we maintain our New Testament definitions for these things. Uh, but keep in mind, when I say there's a lot of churches out there that call themselves churches that are not really churches, I am not talking at all about the building they meet in. I could care less if they meet in a church building or they meet in a storefront or they meet in a home or they meet in a public park somewhere. Uh, the, the location where they meet is irrelevant to whether they are a lampstand or not. If Jesus Christ has planted them as a lampstand, and if he's holding a star in his right hand, then that is a local church by New Testament definition. The local church is not a building, nor is it defined by the specific place where it regularly assembles. And those are the verses we looked at on Sunday. 
<clears throat> the church is a body that requires the proper working of each individual part. And so when we think of it in terms of offices and functions, and we got to stop thinking of it in, in, uh, a corp in a business sense and think of it more in a body sense, that we are a body and the different parts come together and uh, the, the joints and ligaments and that which every part, every joint supplies is what links us together as a body. And when one member is hurting, we all hurt. When one member rejoices, we all rejoice. That's how we're designed as a body. And the church has particular conduct as the pillar and support of the truth. I love that First Timothy 3 passage, how you know how you ought to conduct yourself in the church of God, which is the household of God, the pillar and support of the truth. And I can't emphasize that enough because that's a legitimate fear of the Lord application. It's not legalism, but it is a legitimate fear of the Lord application for how do we conduct ourselves in the household of God. You know, every house has rules and uh, every household, the, the head of the household sets the rules. And it may be uh, your house is, is a little bit more strict than somebody else's house, or maybe your neighbor's house is more liberal than your house. Uh, there's a variety of, of houses with different rules. The head of the house sets the rules, and we understand that. Well, the head of this house is, the, is Jesus Christ, the head of the church, and he has set the rules for his household and uh, for how we ought to conduct ourselves in the household of God, which is the pillar and support of the truth. So we uh, discussed that as well. Now, in the development, we've gone through most of these already. There's A through G, and we virtually got it complete before we ran out of time on Sunday between the two hours that we had to work with. I try to avoid using the word organization and consistently use the word organism instead of organization. And so we have organism. And then, of course, organisms are in the news a lot these days with viruses and other organisms that are uh, running rampant. But uh, the church is an organism that hopefully is running rampant uh, as uh, believers in Jesus Christ can scour this earth and spread the good news to, uh, to this lost and dying world. But the local church is Jesus' designed organism for equipping church saints for the work of service. And I try to repeat a lot of these elements in many of these repeating points that uh, Jesus designed it this way. And so it's functioning the way he designed it. And it's not just something. Uh, some of the liberals would tell you that, well, it just kind of naturally developed out of the Jewish synagogues. And it just kind of kind of happened in the course of tradition and in the course of the years going by. And the, the natural explanations for how the church began, every natural explanation out there is unbiblical and wrong. Because the church began when the Holy Spirit descended and the church began by design. And Jesus promised, I will build my church. And this is the, the hand of Jesus Christ at work. And it's not human tradition that uh, turns synagogues into churches. It is Jesus Christ as the head of the church that, that uh, sent the Holy Spirit that began the church on Pentecost. So uh, if there's questions on that, I hope there are. Uh, we can address that at the end of the hour when we get to our Q&A time. Uh, again, Jesus designed it. Uh, the local church is what Jesus Christ designed as the organism for serving and caring for one another. Not an organization, an organism. There's plenty of organizations out there, but we are the living organism, whereby we are members one of another and members of something that's now over 2,000 years old or close to 2,000 years old. Most of the church is in heaven today, but the generation that's still alive we are divided into particular local churches. And that's important to understand as well, because we are the ones that are supposed to serve and care for us, for one another. And we looked at those verses on Sunday also. Deciding between brethren, the judicial function, Jesus designed the church to make the judicial decisions. Again, for us, we are our own jurisdiction when it comes to uh, decisions that must be made. All right, and so this is what we see in 1 Corinthians 6. How dare we go to court and try to sue and, and drag brothers and sisters before a, uh, an earthly court? They do not have jurisdiction over us. We have jurisdiction over us. We also on Sunday spoke about the dynamic. And, uh, and I really, I think this is my favorite point of, of A through G. 
the dynamic of the assembly. What happens when you are assembled together? There's something very special when the, uh, when the church is in session, when the church is assembled. So we are an assembly, but for much of the week, uh, we are not assembled. But when the assembly is assembled, that's special, okay? At the times and dates and places, whether it's a literal place or a virtual place, like we're learning now, we are, we are assembled presently. We're assembled in cyberspace. We're assembled in go-to-meeting, in a, in a go-to-meeting conference room. And here we are. And this is our assembly. And uh, 24 of us are now assembled in this place. And there is a dynamic at work because where two or three are together, there I am in their midst. And when we agree that we, we have the reflected agreement of Jesus Christ in the like-mindedness, it's called the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, that we come together in the name of Jesus Christ. There is a dynamic at work here. And this doesn't take place in, in secular gatherings. It doesn't take place uh, in work or in the military or on the job or uh, in your bowling league or at the Scrabble Club or any other assembly of people. You can put three or four people, put 10 people together. And uh, the more people you add, the more problems you add. Where is the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace? It is uh, in the local church, and we can appreciate that. And we looked at all of those verses on Sunday, and I would just encourage you to go through those verses again and again and, and pray over them. Consider the application that we have. The public presence of a local church is a testimony. And uh, this is where I think uh, there is an advantage in our culture. There's an advantage because uh, the United States has always been a land of freedom that we've, uh, since our founding and even before our founding, uh, during colonial times, uh, there was freedom to build uh, church buildings and for local church congregations to have a public presence in that way. And in, in a lot of cases, the church building was the center of town. It was a gathering place. And, and uh, even still in modern times, local churches uh, tend to get opened up as polling places. They can be gathering places in the community where people come together for different functions or different things, town meetings or elections or, or uh, shelters in, uh, in uh, uh, storms or earthquakes or fires or other things. Uh, local churches, having a public presence is a testimony to other local churches as well as the unbelieving world in which we sojourn. Local churches may volitionally cooperate with other local churches in missionary and humanitarian endeavors. And uh, this we discussed as well, and this uh, we can illustrate. Not only do we have the, the Bible illustrations of this, but of course we have our own illustrations of this. Uh, it's not surprising that uh, churches that are very similar to ours, now we're not a denomination and we're not under a hierarchy, and uh, we don't have an authority uh, outside beyond the local church of Austin Bible Church, besides Jesus Christ, he is the head of the church. He is the head of our local church. So we don't have to um, support missionaries because our denomination tells us to. We support the missionaries that we are led by Jesus Christ to support because we love them, we know them, we pray for them, uh, that they are a part of our ministry and we are a part of their ministry. We're partners in these endeavors. But it's not a surprise that Austin Bible Church has many missionaries in common with Lost Pines Bible Church or in common with uh, Baraka Church or in common with uh, West Houston Bible Church or, or uh, My Childhood Church uh, or Spokane Bible Church, that we will very frequently have many missionaries in common because this is what we're doing in cooperating with other local churches in missionary and humanitarian endeavors. I fully expect in the next generation that Grace Notes is going to be a, uh, a missionary ministry that's gonna be far larger than it presently is. And it's gonna require uh, administrative support and other support uh, beyond Austin Bible Church, that there's gonna be uh, other local churches partnering in those endeavors. Finally, uh, the last point, um, there will come a time that we'll have to go into hiding. In many times and places, ever since Pentecost, local churches have gone into hiding. And uh, that there are come times, and there's times today and uh, around the world. Now, not in the United States, where we're very blessed and we're very protected. Uh, you know, spiritually speaking, I think we're quite uh, 
uh, uh, fat, dumb, and happy. That's uh, that's who we are and where we are as Americans. But I have friends in other countries, in uh, friends in Cameroon that have to be smart about where they meet and how. And uh, when the bullets start flying, they have to stop their church service and go run in the jungle and hide. I've got uh, brothers and sisters, friends in Nicaragua that have to be careful about what they do. I have friends in the Philippines that have to be careful about what they do. And in fact, we have uh, a couple of sisters that regularly stream our podcast and, uh, and they do that because they can and because they have to. Uh, they live in a Muslim area of Mindanao and they can't be known as being Christians. So um, it is what it is. And, uh, and we, we're thankful for the website. We're thankful for streaming. We're thankful for a lot of opportunities to, uh, to do this. And could that day come in America? Can the day come where you and I will have to go into hiding? where uh, we'll no longer own our building and that'll be confiscated and our public uh, assembly will no longer be uh, permitted. Well, uh, uh, some people say that'll never happen, not in America. And, uh, and I say, uh, the Bible says, don't put the Lord your God to the test. Uh, never say never. And uh, don't assume that the way things have always been is the way things will always stay because uh, evil men and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. We will see that uh, those days may come for us as well. So we better get uh, we better get prepared to deal with uh, persecution. By the way, today is not persecution. Uh, having a, a judge order that you have to stay home and stay in shelter, having a court order that says uh, you know you can't go to your church building and have services. Uh, we're not being persecuted. We're not being singled out. Christian churches are not being um, treated differently than any other group that uh, there's no group that's allowed to uh, to meet. There's no group that's allowed to have to uh, over, you know, 10 or more or to meet in a public building. So we're not being singled out. The only people that are exempt from the mayor's order, the only people that are exempt from the court order, um, see in Austin, it's a mayor's order. In Williamson County, it's a county judge. Uh, I guess Travis County, the commissioner's court also reflected the uh, the city of Austin's order. Anyway, um, the only exemption is homeless people. Homeless people are exempt from uh, from this stay at home order, which makes sense. How do you stay at home if you don't have a home? But it is uh, it's phrased in a curious way when it says uh, people experiencing homeless conditions are exempt from uh, from this order. All right. What I want to get to now in the summary and conclusion, I want to give some kind of some big ideas. And I want us to, and these are the takeaways. And I want you to, I want these to haunt you in the coming days as you, uh, as you think about these things. Comparing and contrasting the 21st century with the first century can seem like two alien civilizations on two alien planets. Te technology, especially transportation, communication, and information systems are almost incomparable. If I'm gonna, if I'm gonna put uh, a screen up here and compare the first century with the 21st century, there's not much to compare. You know, you can put scrolls on papyrus uh, versus, uh, you know, versus today. And, uh, you know, think about it. What, what would the apostle Paul have done if he'd had a go-to-meeting? What would he have done if he'd had email? and uh, Facebook and Twitter and all these other things. If he could have pulled out a smartphone and sent a text message to Timothy, uh, you know, don't forget the, the, uh, the parchments. Timothy would have replied on the text message and said, what's a parchment? <laughs> all right, uh, but try to compare and contrast them. I recommend, if you've ever read, there's a, there's a marvelous book. Stephen Ambrose wrote a book on the Lewis and Clark expedition. I'm looking for it up on my shelf right now and I should have prepared ahead of time to to show it to you on camera, but it's called Undaunted Courage. And if you read Undaunted Courage by Stephen Ambrose, I recommend it. Uh, it's the story of uh, Lewis and Clark and their, their uh, the voyage of discovery and how they, they went uh, all the way to the Pacific Ocean and back in uh, uh, Thomas Jefferson's instructions for what they were doing. Um, and I recommend, and, and even if you don't read it, just get it to the library and, and read the first chapter. The opening introduction to that book is marvelous because Stephen Ambrose does a great job setting the stage and informing modern readers uh, at how 
alien things were in the early 1800s, in 1805, for example. And he pointed out, he said, Thomas Jefferson has more in common with Julius Caesar than he has in common with you and me today. And uh, so looking back 2000 years earlier or 200 years later, and it's like apples and oranges, it's like night and day, you can't compare them. And so uh, with, with Julius Caesar and riding out a scroll and getting on a horse and sending a fast rider, uh, that's, that's much more in common with, with uh, Thomas Jefferson than where we are today. Remember Thomas Jefferson is before railroads, before uh, telegraphs, before any of that. The technology that Lewis and Clark had available to them, now they did have gunpowder, grant you that, uh, but otherwise, <laughs> uh, when, they, when they crossed the continent, they were not much uh, ahead of, of uh, the Roman Empire. And that's, that's really, it's worth, worth considering. So stress that, and then with point B, I'm gonna, I'm gonna confute it, I'm gonna change my mind, okay? not change my mind, I'm gonna contrast it. So again, think about everything that's different. Think about your, your work life, think about technology, think about our culture, think about our politics, think about everything. The 21st century is so alien to the first century, but you wanna know what's not alien? What is almost identical is the church, the local church. Think about it, the local church is a valuable and timeless institution. And if you disagree, that's fine, disagree. Shoot me an email, tell me I'm out of my mind. Um, notice there's no scripture on this uh, screen. This is just my opinion. The local church is a valuable and timeless institution whereby the first century and the 21st century in nearly every way are almost indistinguishable. Now, Call me crazy, call me wrong, but think about it. And I want, I want this to, to sink in. The local church, the local church today, in almost every way, can be almost indistinguishable and should be almost indistinguishable from the local church in the first century. In other words, when we study Philippians and we study the church at Philippi, or we study uh, Colossians and the church at Colossae, or Corinthians and the church at Corinth, all right? You got a bunch of sinners saved by grace that are struggling to grow together. <laughs> and it's the same thing today. And it's a marvelous thing, nearly indistinguishable. And I would support, I mean, I would further my case by saying to whatever extent our modern churches are different, I think you're starting to identify elements of our modern churches that are no longer biblical that are no longer identifiable as New Testament churches. So think about that. All right, let me spell it out for you here. Unbelievers getting saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Is that a point that applies to, uh, to the first century? Is that a point that applies to uh, Colossae in the church that's there? Or is that, uh, is that a point that applies to us today in uh, 2020, Austin, Texas? It applies to both. And it applies to every generation in between. It applies to Martin Luther and the Reformation. It applies to uh, every generation in between. Unbelievers getting saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And praise God, this is gonna happen uh, after we're dead and gone, uh, when our children and grandchildren are uh, keeping on, keeping on. And when uh, when Pastor Bob Bolander the, the seventh is pastor at uh, at Austin Bible Church, uh, they're still going to see unbelievers getting saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. They're also going to have believers growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ, because this is a description of what a church is. This is a description of what a local church does. And it's been doing it since the first century. It's been doing it since Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit descended. This has been the function of a local church. Unbelievers getting saved and believers growing in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now, as I say, I didn't put Bible verses on these. You can put Bible verses on yourself. You know, I think we can all add a verse for point one. We can all add a verse for point two. What is it, Second Timothy 3 or Second Peter 3? To grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Brethren assembling together for teaching, communion, prayer, and fellowship. 
brethren assembling together for teaching, communion, prayer, and fellowship. I know this is first century because I can read it in Acts 2.42, all right, which is where I asked you to, uh, to turn to back when we first opened in prayer. And here's where this is. This is where I'm going to do what I learned this morning. And I'm going to go ahead and keep my slideshow up and running while I lay this over top of it. How about that? Are we getting fancy or what? I tell you, <laughs> we're practically a mega church. All right. So here, I'm joking. Okay. Here, here we have, this is a way that we can keep PowerPoint up and running where you can see the points and see what I'm talking about. But then we can lay the Bible uh, over top of it there. And uh, we can float it around as necessary and resize it as necessary. Turn off the Greek if you don't even look at the Greek. But Acts 2.42 says that we're continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. This is our foundation. This is what churches do. And uh, if you lose any one of these, then you, um, you end up with something that's less than a New Testament local church. And I think the more that our uh, modern American churches uh, depart from this, uh, they're departing from a New Testament church. And by the way, as you look at these points, one, two, and three, and we apply it today in 2020, is there any distinction between uh, an American church and a Filipino church or a Ukrainian church or a Cameroonian church? Now, they're going to be different uh, lifestyles and there's going to be different cultures and there's going to be different uh, there's going to be different food items served at the potluck. OK, but notice potluck isn't on this list. OK, well, there is the breaking of bread and prayer. So there is fellowship time. All right. It just happens to be the cuisine is going to be different in uh, in these different lands. As uh, as we come to it. Suggestion, put the. Bible upper right or upper left. Well, I, I'm going to move it around because as the slideshow advances, um, maybe when I get past talking about points one and two, I may move it up there. I may move it. I just I want to keep it. Right now I'm talking about point three, so I want point three to be visible. All right. Thank you for that. Good suggestion. There was also a suggestion that we could stretch it left and right and shrink it down underneath the slides. That was another suggestion. And we'll we'll uh, we'll try a lot of things. This is the learning curve and uh, we'll we'll find what works. And if it works, we'll use it. If it doesn't work, we'll throw it out. We'll never do that again. Um, in any event, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Also, I need to know if the text is large enough to read on your screens. And we've got a variety of screens. Some people are using iPads. Some people are using cell phones. Some people are streaming. Uh, um, somebody told me they had me on a 55-inch TV the other night because they were streaming YouTube to their uh, to their TV. And uh, a 55 inch TV, and I said, I'm sorry, that's, uh, that's a high resolution that I didn't get makeup applied to for uh, the, the news media will put makeup on for those kind of those kind of things. All right. But as we look at this list, this is a true of a first century local church. This is true of a 21st century local church. This is true of a church in Antioch a church in Philadelphia, a church in Rome, a church in uh, in Cyprus. Uh, wherever the apostles traveled, Paul did not change really anything. And I'm going to prove that tonight when we get to the next portion of what we're doing here. All right, I'm going to I'm going to demonstrate that. And so this is applicable for American churches, Filipino churches, uh, Cameroonian churches, Nicaraguan churches, and uh, you name it. Unbelievers are getting saved. Believers are growing in grace and knowledge. Brethren are assembling together for teaching, communion, prayer, and fellowship. Each generation is waiting for the trumpet. Each generation. I think this is the blessed hope. And it's sad to me that uh, so many uh, in the 21st century have gone apostate, where uh, uh, very few churches are dispensational anymore. And uh, those that are not dispensational, the covenant churches, are becoming all millennial. Um, or 
the possibly post-tribulational, which is really a, a non-rapture view. If you're post-tribulational, why bother having a rapture? Uh, if you had, if you endured the tribulation anyway, what's the point in uh, launching up to the clouds to get your resurrection body and then dropping back down? It's it's just an unbiblical view. We can demonstrate that conclusively. But each generation waiting for the trumpet, and uh, each generation uh, believing that they are the rapture generation, right up to the day they die, and then their children can go on believing that they are the rapture generation right up to the day they die, and. Uh, so it goes. All of this transcends political systems, economic systems, cultures, languages, and centuries. So we have a definition of a local church here in these five points that's applicable in every century from the first to the 21st. That's true in all political systems. Uh, we, we just so happen to have a representative republic where we can vote for our uh, local state and federal leaders. But these principles are just as true in, uh, in communist regimes. Uh, it's true under economic capitalism, economic socialism, economic communism. Um, these definitions of, of local churches don't change. This is what a local church is, what it always is. And it doesn't, uh, it doesn't update itself to get with the times, which is really the lie that uh, when the liberals tell us that it's about time that we started to ordain women, well, why is that? Did, uh, did, uh, did the New Testament get updated all of a sudden? We're still a New Testament church. And until, uh, until uh, the canon comes to an end, oh, wait a minute, not one jot or tittle will pass away. And so uh, we, we're going to be a New Testament church, not a postmodern thing that's not a New Testament church. Same thing too, uh, so ordaining women, ordaining homosexuals, uh, blessing homosexual marriages, other things like that. Uh, we're not free to update the New Testament because the text is what it is. And if we're going to be a New Testament church, then we're going to be a true local church as per the New Testament revelation. So all of this transcends political systems, economic systems, cultures, languages, and centuries. Finally, the church is built upon a rock and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. If you think that rock is Peter, uh, think again. All right, that's a bad interpretation. It's bad theology. We don't agree with Roman Catholicism. The church is built upon a rock and the rock is not Peter. Matthew 16, 18. Uh, this is Jesus to his disciples. He'd been quizzing them about who do people think I am? Who do, who do you think I am? And they were getting a lot of answers, this and that. But when he said, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, son of the living God. This is perfect. And this is the rock. This testimony of who the Christ is, is the foundation for the church. So you are the Christ, son of the living God. And, and Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon, son of John. Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter. This is Petros. And upon this Petra, this uh, rock, I will build my church. Now it's a play on words, but it's a play on words that uses the name Peter and the noun for rock, and they're not the same. I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it so if you want to read it in the greek you can read it in the greek kago de soe lego hatisu ace petros there's your petros i'll color it green so you can see it you are petros that's the masculine noun for peter and then he says kai epitaute te petra he says upon this petra Notice the, uh, the different form. It's not Petros. He doesn't say, on this Petros, I will build my church. He says, on this Petra, I will build my church. So upon this Petra, and it's not Petros, it's Petra. And the, the demonstrative pronoun is feminine. The noun is feminine, whereas Peter is masculine. 
Anybody here think that uh, Peter was transgender? <laughs> okay, no. All right, you are Peter, masculine gender, Petros, and upon this Petra, this feminine gender Petra, I will build my church. Wekatameso is a future tense verb. It's future tense, I will build. The church doesn't exist yet. When he's speaking these words, this is uh, this is leading up to the cross. This is in the fall of uh, 32 AD. He'll be on the cross the, the next spring in the month of March. He'll go to the cross on Passover. So he's he's approaching the crucifixion. But at this point when he's speaking, there is no church. The church does not exist yet. The church is a new creation. And he says, I will build my church, my ecclesion, and uh, the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. The uh, Pulai Hadu. Here's your Pulai for your gates and your Hadu for Hades. The gates of Hades will not overpower it, will not prevail. And so this is a promise. And whatever it is, uh, coronavirus is not going to prevail against the church. Coronavirus, uh, uh, economic collapse is not going to prevail against the church. Uh, plagues have come and gone. Uh, economic collapses have come and gone. Political upheavals have come and gone. Uh, revolutions have come and gone. Uh, nations have been conquered by other nations. The church continues. The church is eternal. And uh, this is uh, an absolute promise from our Savior, and I hope we can appreciate that. All right. Well, that's my conclusion then. So you have the, uh, the complete outline there. I'm going to go ahead and redock this back where it belongs. I want to share just a few more things, and then we'll go to Q&A time. It's uh, 10 minutes after 8. So we still have about 20 minutes remaining in our hour. And uh, and I don't know how much Q&A time we're going to have. Um, it just depends on how quickly. I'm going to run through some features here and show you some, some Bible study ideas. Um, tell you what, let me change the order on that. Rather than um, take up too much time on one thing and then run out of time for the next. I'm going to swap it around. So let's go ahead and do a question and answer time now, which means you can, uh, I still have the cameras off. You can't go on camera, but you can um, raise your hand, I guess. No, you can click the chat bubble and uh, say, I have a question. And then uh, when I see the chat bubble turn red and I see who has a question, I'll then uh, let you know, there's one. All right, so Maria Blake has a question. Uh, at the, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. This is uh, not Maria though, that sounds too deep. Yes, it's a, it's a much more masculine version. Gotcha. Um, so it's, an, it's a question just vocabulary wise because I was reading it as you were speaking to it and I didn't understand what it meant. So Matthew 16, 19. Uh -huh. well, whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven. So it's not the word lose. What is loose? It's the opposite of binding. So you can tie something up or you can untie something. You can bind something or you can unbind something. And so those are the opposites. The binding and loosing are the opposites. And uh, what we do on earth is a reflection of what's already been done in heaven. And this is where not only do you have to pay attention to the vocabulary, you also have to pay attention to the, um, let me get my Greek back up here. You have to pay attention to the grammar as well. And so it's not just vocabulary. Here we go. So. Uh, verse 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever. So uh, here's the, in the Greek, you got doso soi tas kledos tes basileas tu urinon. There's your kingdom of heaven. And here's your whatever. Kai ha aeon deeses. And there's your phrase for whatever. Whatever you bind. And whatever you bind. Uh, upon the earth, epites gase. I'll make that green as well. So whatever you bind upon the earth, then it said, 
will be bound in the heavenlies. I'm going to make this uh, yellow just for the contrast. Now, when you're looking at it, you have the same verb deo for binding, and you have the uh, same verb for loosing. I haven't gotten to the loosing yet, but that's uh, that's the next phrase. It's it's the same both places. We can just use one for example. So whatever you bind, ha aeon deeses. All right. Now this is an aorist subjunctive. Whatever you bind, that's an aorist subjunctive of deo. Whatever you bind on the earth, then it says it will be. That's a future will be but that future is combined with a uh, perfect participle and i know i've lost people already but this is this is for language geeks this is a beautiful thing and so the perfect participle perfect passive participle means it's already been done it's already been done so whatever you bind on earth shall all will already have been bound in heaven so the activity in heaven precedes the activity on earth. Same thing with the loosing activity. The verb uh, 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 luo, to loose. It's, uh, it's an aorist uh, subjunctive in, uh, in the first part on the earth. And then it's, uh, it's a future with a perfect passive participle in the, in the heavenly aspect of it. Does that answer your question? Do you understand what I'm saying? I'll make sure I'm not losing you here, Dylan. Well, there was a lot of language things in there I didn't get, but I am understanding. <laughs> I am okay. understanding what you mean by it. Yes. Okay. So that is whatever you bind on earth, whatever you loose on earth, assuming, of course, that the pastor of the church is uh, humble before the Lord and uh, actually listening to what the Lord has to say, and he's not just doing his own thing and and venturing off the path and doing whatever uh that's the uh the stipulation on this all right uh, no i don't think huh okay yeah no that's how it'll appear when the video is finished that's not how it appears now while we're live and uh live and in color all right so that's the, that's the uh, binding and loosing question. Any other questions tonight? Hey, Bob, it's Ed. Can you yes, show sir. me what the chat button is? I don't even know where it is. Oh, I it's thank you a chat uh, request. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it's next to, um, you should have a button that shows the people that are, uh, that are uh, online. And then right next to that, it looks like a comic book bubble. It looks like a Popeye in the comic strips is, is wanting to say something. And when you click it, it'll toggle on and off. I should make a tutorial on how to find these, uh, how to find, there it is. Oh, that was Valerie. Valerie says, uh, can you make me the presenter? Really? You want to yeah. be the presenter? I think sometimes people, yeah, they click that on accident. That please make me the presenter thing comes up on uh, on accident. All right, any other questions? 8.15, we still have 15 minutes. Okay. Hey, Pastor Bob. Yes. I just wanted to let everybody know that we do not have that book that you mentioned. Undaunted courage. Undaunted courage. Oh, the church library does not have that book. But okay. if anybody's interested in getting getting it, I, I can get a copy. It's not really church library material, but um, okay. but yeah, I recommend it. It's good secular reading. It's on anybody who has Audible can see it. Okay. Yes, Ed Cheney asked the question. So if you want to send him a screenshot, you can send him a screenshot. Also, every time one of these chat messages come up, um, you should see the red bubble. So 
So if you've never seen that red bubble, that's uh, that's where your chat window is. All right, any bubble questions? If not, then uh, I'm going to go to the demonstration between now and the end of the hour. Just Pastor to show Bob? You. Yes. Um, before you do, okay. If people don't know about it. When the mic, camera, screen, and leave buttons are visible, you should also have a bar on the right that's got a percentage, a plus, a minus. And at the top, there's a camera button. And if you don't know about it, you can make a screenshot of whatever's on the, instead of having to copy it all down. Yeah, look for that little camera icon and uh, you can start uh, clicking pictures of what's being displayed on the screen. And it'll go to the desktop. Yeah, and uh, you'll load up your desktop in very quick fashion with all kinds of snapped pics that way. Thank you, Robert. That's a good uh, a good reminder. All right. It struck me uh, this afternoon that uh, some people don't have never used the cross references in their Bibles, and it would be worthwhile to do that um, to look at some different verses. And so I'm going to do one here just by way of demonstration for you. And I'm going to turn off my Greek, Bob. You don't need Greek for this. Have you ever noticed when you're reading in your Bible, I'm looking at 1 Corinthians 4, 17. For this reason, I have sent to you Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, and he will remind you of my ways, which are in Christ, just as I teach everywhere in every church. And this is a good um, verse because it, this is Paul talking about a variety of local churches. In fact, every local church that he ever goes to. Uh, and Paul's been in a lot of churches. But, and, and he has particular ways, particular conduct, particular traditions and practices, and they don't change. That his ways in Christ, uh, he teaches in every church that he goes to wherever he is. Now, if you've ever noticed, and this is true in your print Bibles, that you have these cross references. And in this verse, there's an A, B, C, and D. And, and their superscript, these are the little um, highlighted uh, letters, A, B, C, and D. And when you look at the A in verse 17, you, in your print Bible, you'll notice in either at the bottom or in the center margin somewhere, is where all the cross references and tiny little print are going to be uh, listed there. And you'll find the, the, the verse 17 cross references listed as A, B, C, and D. And uh, Logos puts those cross references in as well. And they're, they're searchable and they're clickable and they're, they're very worthwhile going, going through. If you're going to do a study on local churches, for example, you might want to do this to find all the places that talk about uh, all of Paul's churches that he's associated with. And so uh, when I, for example, when I click on the D, I realize, wow, that's, uh, that's four different verses right there. That's 1 Corinthians 7, 17, 1 Corinthians 14, 33, 16, 1, Titus 1, 5. And you can hover over each of them and read them as they come up just by hovering or you can click them one at a time and, and, and literally turn there. Or what I find useful is I go ahead and select them. And then when, after selecting them with a the right click, I'm going to go ahead and save them as a passage list. And now I have a passage list. And you notice my passage list is those four verses. My passage list as is the same four verses that were the cross references there under cross reference D in uh, 1 Corinthians 4 17. And so I'm going to want to head in and save this. I'm going to save this as uh, Paul's um, multiple local churches. Just give it a name, something you can remember. And this is a study that you want to pursue. And in fact, you might want to go ahead and just while you're at it, add 1 Corinthians 4, 17. Because that's the passage that we started this with. 
and you can either drag it to the top if you want or you can reorder it however you want you can even search that and use the sort button there to put them in order all right now don't stop there you got five passages you're looking at there might be more so as you look at each one of these as you look at first corinthians 7 17 only as the lord has assigned to each one as god has called each in this manner let him walk and so i direct in all the churches well that's important to know because this is a chapter that deals with marriage and divorce and staying unmarried and there's practices here that paul is recommending and not only is he saying as the lord has assigned to each one as god has called each but he goes and so i direct in all the churches that, that's all the local churches that he's associated with and we think wow okay so that's uh the cross reference there is first corinthians 4 17 which we've already seen there's even more cross references look at those i i bet you those are verses that i want to study as well when it comes to paul's ministry in local churches so i'm going to right click those i'm going to highlight them i'm going to right click them and i'm going to uh, save them as a passage list well I've already saved them as a passage list. Tell you what, here's what I want to do. I'm going to come over here to the, the passage list I've already made called Paul's Multiple Local Churches. And I'm going to add the selected text. Oh, is it going to let me do that? All right, tell you what, highlight them and then copy them copy them to your clipboard if you need more instruction on this give me a call i'll walk you through it tomorrow or anytime i copied this list of verses to my clipboard now i'm going to come to my uh, uh panel over here for this uh, verse list and i'm going to add passages from my clipboard there we go now they're going to be added now i've got 12 passages in my passage guide Go ahead and sort them. Now I've got them in biblical order. And just keep doing this. Keep doing this. Look at each one of these. And you'll find as you're adding from cross-reference to cross-reference to cross-reference, this is like a rabbit trail times 50. Okay. You're going to spend hours chasing down all these verses that center on local churches. Uh, like 1 Corinthians 11, 16. If one is inclined to be contentious, we have no other practice, nor have the churches of God. <laughs> so if you want to start a contentious practice or tradition at Austin Bible Church, just stop and say, wait a minute, um, Paul didn't have a contentious practice. And uh, none of the churches have a contentious practice. That's uh, not something we want to have here. Likewise, then you get head coverings and other things that are spoken of there in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians 14, God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So this lets you know, you know what? There was never a practice in any of Paul's local churches where uh, confusion was acceptable. Confusion is always uh, not what God has designed. That the Holy Spirit is the, uh, it's the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace should be the uh, order of the day in local churches. But this is a nice, uh, nice verse here, and you can check these too. Make sure there's you're not missing any of the cross references that are mentioned in some of the other ones. Concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. And we find that grace giving, the practices there, should all be consistent, regardless of uh, of what church you're in. That these are practices that that span all the local churches, no matter where Paul went. These are the uh, these are the principles that he put into action. The brother whose fame in the things of the gospel has spread through all the churches, all the churches. So just make sure that you've got all the cross references here. When he talks about his sorrow and his testing, Paul says, apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches every local church paul is associated with and he's got a concern for them anyway you can work your way through this and you'll find that these are all the passages so you end up with 
these different passages that you can then uh, put in different order, uh, organize in different way, classify them in different way, create a list of traditions and customs and practices that uh, that can span all the local churches that aren't limited to any one local church. And uh, I think it's a blessed study. And it'll allow you to uh, to pursue your own rabbit trails, uh, maybe in a way that you've never done before. So I hope that helps. Any questions on that before I close in prayer? I'm not seeing any more chats. I'm not seeing any more red bubbles. No one is speaking up saying that they have any additional questions. Okay. Well, I appreciate your being here tonight. Please keep uh, us in prayer. Keep our church in prayer. Keep our nation in prayer. Keep our president in prayer. Pray that our leaders have the wisdom that they need and that this quarantine is uh, not too short, not too long, uh, not too intense and uh, that the will of Jesus Christ be accomplished. Father, I thank you for tonight. I thank you for the truth of your word. I pray as we continue to experiment with different techniques and different methods that you will uh, just continue to bless our time of study. Open our eyes to the truth of your word. We thank you, Father, and we praise you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.